Hey there, welcome to the Snakebird Podcast. My name's Josh. And I'm Steve. Together we invite you to join us as we explore the mysteries of Scripture, the realm of God, and freedom through Christ. So spread out your wings. And slither in place. Because this is Snakebird. Snake hey, welcome Snakebirds to another episode of the Snakebird Podcast. In today's episode, we have the honor of profiling a woman whose story is not only told in eight short verses, but her impact, legacy, and the application we can draw from it is more valuable than other characters characters with whole sections of the Bible written about them. At first glance, she might seem like a nerd, but when you study her name, she swiftly outpaces that label. (laughs) (laughs) See what I did there? Nice. So, Stephen, I have to ask, who are we profiling today? Well, this character is perhaps most known in the distant parts of your mind as the one with the funny name, a name that makes children laugh and causes adults to look a little bit sideways at, and that is the name Dorcas. Oh, I thought you were going to like try to land the joke by saying Tabitha. (laughs) (laughs) I should have. That would have been funny. Oh, but that's, you know, the Greek translation of her name because Greeks are just funny that way. Yeah. Tabitha is the other translation. What is it? Hebrew? Aramaic? Aramaic. There there it is. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. And probably um, it's that name that causes most people to remember her because Dorcas is only briefly mentioned, like you said, in the New Testament. But worry not, snake birds. By the end of today's episode, you will remember this character for more than just a funny name. Yes. And I hope at the end of this episode, we are going to encourage you to be a Dorcas. <laughs> I'm going to say it several times because I kept asking myself as I was studying, I was like, am, am I going to keep referring to her as Dorcas or Tabitha? Because we got two choices. Yeah. But I, Dorcas just, just rolls off the tongue a little better. The former youth pastor in me <laughs> yeah. says Dorcas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which I didn't know if you knew this, but Dorcas means gazelle. Okay. I heard that. And yes. that is actually a Greek term of endearment for women. Yes, I heard of, of the gazelle in the Song of Solomon. Oh, yes. Some. Yes. So it, it's a very descriptive word yeah. towards the women. I was doing <laughs> my Bible search and I was like, oh, I could, I found gazelles, twin fawns of a gazelle the even. Twin fawns yeah. of the gazelle. I like yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I was just going to say, if you are Greek or you're feeling Greek and you want to refer to a woman with endearment, you can call her Dorcas. Yeah, I think I, I might give that a shot with my wife and see how it goes. <laughs> she might like it. <laughs> she might. <laughs> she might. She might not. Uh, this is magic eight ball. All signs point to no. Yeah, rolling the dice there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Try it, listener, and let us know how it goes. Yeah, we'd love to hear your feedback on that. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but in this scenario, this name fits her really, really well. Yeah, it really does. And, you know, God does speak volumes through the characters with lots of page time in the Bible, but we got to remember that he also speaks in that still small voice through the more subtle character like Dorcas to bring just as much meaning into our lives. So it's going to be neat to see, you know, there's not a ton about her, but what is said, it's going to be worth a look. Well, and I appreciate that her name is so unique so that either the youth pastor in me or just the the nerd can actually say, hey, I want you to be a Dorcas and and bring up those emotions or bring up those memories because of the uniqueness of it and what it means in pop culture and all that. Yeah. You hear that name and you remember the stuff tied to it. Exactly. (laughs) So, yeah. Okay, cool. So I wanted to set the scene a little bit here um, where we're at in the timeline of Acts when we meet Tabitha, because that's where she's found. Tabitha Dorcas. We'll probably interchange that a few times. TBD. TBD. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Tabitha <laughs> Ben Dorcas. Sorry. <laughs> Tab- Did you say Tabitha Von Dorcas? No, I said Tabitha Ben Dorcas. Oh, nice. Which would be Tabitha, son of Dorcas. But OK, TBD. <laughs> OK, so some of this is going to be familiar territory. Um, But let's remember a few things that led to Acts chapter 9, which is the chapter we find Dorcas in. So 11 days after Jesus' death, we see that he appeared to all of his apostles. And then for the next 29 days, we see Jesus appear to various people throughout the region, including the 500 we've talked about in 1 Corinthians 15. And then after Jesus ascends back to heaven, on day 50 after his crucifixion, he gives all of the troops he rallied the past 40 days or so that promised gift, the helper, the Holy Spirit. And we've talked about this this layout before in other episodes about Philip the Evangelist, Apollos, and many other people that God used to kick this little wave of Christianity off that would overtake the world like a tsunami. And God used the conquering of the grave through Jesus to start this tsunami. Elon Musk might say that space is the final frontier, but we know through Christ, conquering death is the true final frontier. There you go. And... um. 
That's precisely why we see so many of these first missionaries that, that went out with such confidence into the fray of opposition, not only from governing authorities, but bloodthirsty rogue agents like Saul before he became Paul. And that actually brings us to chapter 9 of Acts, where we meet Dorcas. I know that was a, a super <laughs> speed through Acts, but yeah. just to kind of lead us up, get a flavor of what's going on. This is the early movement of Christianity. And as we approach chapter 9 here, at the beginning beginning of chapter 9, we see Jesus confronts, then converts Paul. Um, he becomes what DC Talk would call the Jesus freak. Yes. He starts preaching Christ like crazy. And then the next thing we see is that Peter is also traveling in the regions, and um, that kind of springboards us into this story of Dorcas here yeah. in chapter 9. Yeah. And he's in a place called Lydda. And uh, he has a really neat encounter with a guy named uh, Aeneas or Aeneas. And uh, this dude has been paralyzed for over eight years. And we don't know his exact story, but Peter, through the power of the Holy Spirit, is able to heal him. And it changes this whole community. And that leads us right into Acts 9.36. And it says, At Joppa, there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas, this woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. Yeah. And the first thing I think we see there is that she was a disciple. Mm -hmm. And that might not be big news to some of you, but it's really kind of noteworthy, I thought, because this feminine descriptor used for Dorcas here is only used once in the entire New Testament. Wow. Um, we see a lot, plenty of masculine forms of Jesus' disciples throughout the New Testament, but only one do we see in the feminine form, and it goes to our profile here. Yeah. Dorcas. Yeah. That's, that's noteworthy. I know, right? The uniqueness of it. It really is. And I really appreciate what the New Living Translation says of this verse. It says that she was always doing kind things for others and helping the poor. And it made me think about James one twenty seven, and we'll see this further on in the story, but that says, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. And so it seems like because of the way that this verse introduces her, she has a handle on that. She's a disciple, and then she's also helping uh, people and she's loving on them. That's true. And another thing I, I noticed, and um, we've talked about in multiple episodes already that there was cultural hurdles that might've kept women from certain things like mm -hmm. owning land and other, other stuff. And the early Christians had obviously had to navigate these cultural obstacles while progressing into what God desired for them. But as we're going to see, there was a very loving acceptance of this woman as a disciple in the Christian community. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, if you think back, there are mentions of women in the singular form throughout the New Testament. You think of Lydia, the seller of purple that comes up later in the book of Acts. And then I think of even some of the people that Paul um, says, hey, say hi to them at the end of his epistles. But this story seems to me pretty unique in terms of what she does and who she was. Yeah, I think so, too. And the last part of that, too, really stuck out to me, abounding with deeds. And me and Josh are reading, I think, two different versions here, so <laughs> yeah. you're going to hear some interchangeable language. But uh, abounding with deeds of kindness and charity, which she did continually. And um, something I found cool was the word uh, abounding is play race. And the definition is full, abounding in, complete, completely occupied with. And it's the same word we see used in Matthew 14 to describe the overflowing baskets that mm -hmm. they uh, gathered the bread in when Jesus fed the 5,000, and also described in how much of the Holy Spirit Jesus had in himself. Yeah. So this word is speaking um, to an overflowing of kindness and charity, which it's going to be a characteristic we see in a true convert. But in Tabitha's case, it seems that she exercised her radical love for Christ through charity, which was probably her gift. I think it is, as we see this, uh, the same way Paul preached the gospel, which was his gift, and she was greatly loved for it. Yeah, you said that, and it's the same word that was in John chapter 1, verse 14, full of grace and truth. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, I thought that was really neat, too. Um, another thing that a lot of the commentators pointed out is that when it says um, in the New King James, I'm just going to 
throw that out there in case you're like, well, which translation are you talking about now? Um, it says, this woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. And they said, those three words are some of the most important words in correlation to that verse. Yeah. Because some people are like, I intended to help that person, or I had the thought that I could go out and serve the homeless or um, do something really nice, give part of my um, paycheck or tithe or whatever. Yeah. And then it ends right there. And yet she put action to her faith. And that's when we get those three words that say, which she did. Yeah. Which she did continually mm -hmm. in, in my translation. Yeah, which she did. Which book do you speak? <laughs> <laughs> well, it was her life. It was her passion. It was her purpose. I, I, it comes to mind the, the silly jokes of you get up to the pearly gates and it's like, well, what have you done to get in? It's like, well, this one time I did this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She continually did. And not that it's actions that save us, but no. I mean, she was putting real feet to her faith. This, this was her life. This wasn't like a, you know, an Instagram moment where she went to a, a war torn place and handed out bottles of water for, and did it for the gram. Yeah. You know, she, <laughs> she really was uh, a, a full-time servant and this really was who, who she was. You know, perseverance is an extremely important thing to see in a Christian because it speaks to a truly changed life. Mm -hmm. Uh, it separates those who wear a title from those who live a title. Yeah. Uh, those who have modified their behavior from those who are a new creation. And I, I know that we all have seasons of um, struggle and even disobedience at times, but I like to focus on that word continually. Um, the deeds that she continually did. She was continually being refilled by the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, who do we continually run to? While seasons affect our joy, do we eventually come back to the one who fills our heart with his heart, allowing us to give that back to others? You yeah. Know, this continually returning and, um, you know, striving for God and his will. Yeah. You made me think of uh, the person who says, do I want to serve in a, like as a servant or am I a servant? Like there's yeah. a, there's a, yeah. a big difference because you can serve at a certain time and, and, oh, I served. Yeah. But then when you're actually... A servant, that means you are full-time. That's true. That's who you are. Yeah, she wasn't a flash in the pan. And sometimes I think people will get emotional, will get really zealous about their faith for a while, like you said, but then the new will wear off and they'll fizzle out. Yeah. And Dorcas wasn't of that category. She was of the category that we read of in, in Hebrews 10, 39, that says, we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but those who have faith to the preserving of the soul. That's what we see in Dorcas. This, yeah. This um this perseverance. She was hardcore. She was. <laughs> you yeah. know, I mean, there's no other way to say it. And she made it into the pages of scripture because God wanted us to yeah. see these things in her. Yeah. I just I appreciate that she's not flighty. This this was real to her. Mm -hmm. And she took it very seriously and she lived it every day. She did. And so uh what happens next? Uh I'll just read the verse, but it because <laughs> we're we have so <laughs> few verses. Yeah. But it happened in those days that she became sick and died. And when they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. And just to clarify here, um, Dorcas is dead. Yes. Um, and some skeptics have said, you know, Jesus didn't really die. They might say Dorcas did. Dorcas died here as well as Jesus. She mm -hmm. was dead. They don't they don't wash a body and lay it aside unless the deal's done. <laughs> yes. They they knew she was dead. Yeah, that's pretty intrusive. If if she's not. <laughs> yeah, that's a bit, that's a bit creepy, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, let, let's I'm get back to the. I'm not dead. <laughs> I just thought that needed to be pointed yeah. out because yeah. it's it's kind of relevant to the um, next part of the story. Yes, it is. <laughs> okay, uh, which is verse thirty-eight. Did, did you have any? So you see, we're sailing through these verses because there's not a lot there. But, no, but um, that verse thirty-eight is eventful. Yeah, I didn't break down the Greek of became sick and died. I took it as literal. <laughs> <laughs> and so verse 38 continues. And since Lydda was near Joppa, uh, weren't we just hanging out in Joppa with a certain uh, unwilling prophet last week? We were. Yeah. Um, the, and the disciples heard that Peter was there. They sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay in coming to them. Apparently, he was already kind of heading that way, but they thought... Hey, Peter's right there. Let's see if we can get him here sooner. Yeah. And th this is kind of where things get interesting because Dorcas has died and she's a noteworthy saint. Mm -hmm. um, but is she that noteworthy? I mean, we, we had a lot of things going on back then. The initial push of a worldwide religion. Um, Dorcas was, was she really worthy of someone who some consider the first pope? 
I mean, obviously, <laughs> if you've listened to the podcast, you know that me and Josh don't believe it. Yeah. He was the first pope or any pope for that matter. But nonetheless, Peter was the guy who asked the the famous question that got the response, upon this rock, I will build my church. Right. Peter was more than an mm. elder at a local church. Yeah. Um, and here we have a culturally throwed off situation where a servant woman has died. And all of a sudden, the infamous Peter comes to the rescue. And at this point, it, the whole first shall be last and last shall be first kind of comes into picture. It really does. Peter, Peter comes to the scene. Yeah. Well, and I thought this was interesting that this is about, depending on who you read or even if you can Google, because now the modern day Joppa is called Jaffa and it's right next to Tel Aviv. Because I said last week, modern day Joppa is Tel Aviv, which just, it's part of the city. So uh, it's Jaffa and then Lydda is now Lod. And if you look at it, it's about between 10 to 15 miles away. And, and that's a three plus hour walk. Yeah. And so these guys, they tear off for at least a six hour round trip. Yeah. And you know, I think of, I think of, of the scene where it's like, it's not fitting for us to clean tables when we've got the gospel to be Mm -hmm. spreading. And, and that's kind of, some people read that wrong, but I I think of, of the calling that Peter and along with the other missionaries are called to, and this is a break they're having to take from that. Um, some might think it's not because it's, it's obviously in God's will that he goes there. Yeah. But it, it's interesting because they're on mission. Yes. Well, and it's another interesting thing about this community of disciples there in Joppa is that seeing at this point, we have no record in acts of any of the apostles raising the dead. And so this was evidence of their tremendous faith and belief in the power of the risen Christ that he could use Peter to bring Dorcas back to life. Yeah. And, and I mean, for them to go like, hey, Peter. Uh, so it's never really been done by any of Jesus's gang, <laughs> <laughs> only by the master so far. But if you're feeling up to it, we really have this saint who's in need of some help. Yeah. It, it really was a very, a very rare thing for someone to call upon. Yeah. Because I think what Paul did it with a young boy that fell out of a window. Eutychus. Eutychus, yeah. yes. So, but it, but it's not something that was happening a lot. No, at it all. It was pretty rare. Yeah. So this was a step of faith. Yes. And um, that would. Uh, are we ready to go into verse thirty-nine, Josh? Yes. I wanted to say one more thing. Okay. I think it's interesting that you're saying saint yeah. as we talk about her because in Acts uh, nine, this is the first place that it started using the word saints when it's referring to Christians. I did not even know that. Yeah, I found that. That's out. pretty cool. Yeah, and and of course not that they're saints like we would refer to them maybe in modern belief but anybody who is a believer in jesus is a saint, is a saint. yeah you know? yeah when you say i remember when i first discovered that in the word i was like what yeah <laughs> yeah i'm not catholic yeah <laughs> that's, and, and, that's the first thing i thought which it was just a, a presupposition in my head yeah and we do honor some of those that have the title of saints because they're you know they've done some pretty spectacular things some of them but yeah you're also you're saint stephen i'm yeah saint joshua well you think of like you know, saint michael or whatever it's 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 like saying brother michael but yes. but we're telling his story you know yeah yeah so, anyway yeah. yeah in case you didn't know all that verse 39 peter went with them and when he arrived he was taken upstairs to the room all the widows stood around him crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that dorcas had made while she was still with them now this is obviously a really sad scene here and um she is miss greatly dorcas is we see the widows who knew her Um, They're crying and mourning for their dear friend, and they're showing Peter all of the garments that she had made for people. And um, it's sad, but I I did think about the fact that, you know, robes and clothes back then were of great value. Mm -hmm. Um, It wasn't, there was no mass production factory where you could just go get pants and shirt like at Walmart for (laughs) under 20 bucks. Yeah. No um, old navy. The the fact that that they were showing him these things it shows that she put a lot of effort into that community and love and that she cared for them. Yeah. And it's it's a sad scene because they're sitting there, they're mourning her death, they're they're remembering her by the things that she did for them, and it's just a sad little scene. Yeah. I, like for me, it reminded me that Angel had some shirts that were her grandfather's. And she made them into pillows and like the family could just sit there and kind of look at them and go, this is the memory of the person that I loved. And, and not necessarily that anybody made the shirts for him from the family, but it was that, that connection going, 
she loved us so much that look at, look at what she gave us yeah, and just holding it there. And maybe even just having the sensory, um, part of like the smell of it and just sitting there going, Oh, I can't believe, uh, she's passed. Yeah. And if you're old enough, I think we can all relate to that. And someone that is passed, you yeah. know, remembering them by th- little things like that. Yeah. And the heartbreak that you feel and yeah. like you're excited because they're a believer. So that means they've gone on yeah. to be with the Lord, but that there's also that bittersweet of them passing and, and that, that doesn't just go away. And, and before we continue on, I had just a couple of things. Um, it, we go back to Peter, you know, and we talk about how you said, um, we shouldn't be given to serving the tables anymore. We should be giving to prayer and the apostles doctrine and the reading of the word. Um, one thing that I found that somebody pointed out was the hierarchy of the Christian church works a lot different than maybe a business does because we would almost position Peter as like the CEO of the church right now. As some people would say he's the, he's the Pope, yeah. which is not true at all to, to what you and I. It's probably how this to. whole thing got started. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> he was, he was in a position of high authority. Yeah. The high authority. So, but the way that we view it is that as a, as a Christian leader, you want to be the servant of all. And Peter didn't command people. In fact, he served them. And because of this, he, he came to them and in the Lord's leading, he was at their beck and call. And so whatever he was doing in Lydda, he just dropped it and said, I'm, I'm coming to Joppa. You guys need my help. I'll be there. I don't know what I'm going to be able to do, but I'm coming. Yeah, he had a he heard the call and he had a servant's heart. Yeah. And that's what happened. Yeah. And speaking of the the robes and the tunics and the garments, this is what Spurgeon said about these uh, items of clothing. I thought this was really neat. He said, These are the best relics of the saints. Many leave behind them wealth wrung out of the poor, but hers was a noble legacy. Oh, yeah. And he was saying, it's not about what you have when you end, it's what you're leaving behind. It's the legacy of your life. And, yeah. and I appreciate that they weren't like, well, she didn't pay her taxes or anything like that. They yeah. weren't like, they were saying, this is what she gave me. This is the legacy she left. Yeah, that's very true. So we got this, this scene where everybody's gathered around their morning and um, starting in verse 40, Peter sends them all out of the room. And the, I'll start reading from there. Then he got down on his knees and prayed. Turning toward the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up, and he took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called for the believers, especially the widows, and presented her alive to them. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, we read past this a lot of times in Scripture, but what a thing yeah. to witness, to be a part <laughs> yeah. of being in the room. Uh, yeah. To to have the eyes open and to to rise, it just to, if you really think about it, it's more miraculous than just reading past. It is, yeah. Because <laughs> if that were to happen today, we'd be like, wow. Yeah, we'd be having experts trying to explain it away. <laughs> it, very much so, especially the whole. Well, she she wasn't really dead. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and you know, I've often wondered in, in certain cases why God allows some to be brought back, mm. some he does not. And there's probably a lot of Christians who died in these early years who never received this type of, there was a lot of Christians that never received this type of miracle, yeah. which we talked about earlier. Yeah. And even today, people wonder why God allows healing for one and not another. And of course, these are all questions that we can't get answered in the here and now, but we know that God uses these events for a very specific reason or reasons, and I believe the next verse, 42, it's going to give us a good idea of, of why he did it, I think. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it's a what a miraculous moment. Yeah, and I wanted to point out that this is a really neat story that has very similar parallels to Mark chapter 5, uh, verses 34 through 43. As Jesus raises Jairus' daughter, and the story is told here in Mark chapter 5. It's also told in Luke chapter 8. It's a, it's a little 12-year-old girl, and Jairus or Jairus comes, and he goes, Jesus, my daughter is sick, and she's she's dying And, um, at that time, there's also the woman with the 12 year flow of blood and she reaches out and she touches the hem of his garment and there's that. And then the servants come and they say, well, don't worry about it. She's passed. And Jesus says, I'm still going to come. And as he gets to the house, all of a sudden there's a lot of people mourning and crying and he sends them all out except for the parents. And he sends, uh, 
he sends all of his disciples away except for Peter, James, and John. And so he goes in and some of the parallels are he puts the morning people out of the room. Jesus says, Talitha kumi, which is little girl arise. Peter says, Tabitha kumi, which means Tabitha arise. Jesus took her hand before because he really wasn't worried about becoming ceremonially unclean. Peter took her hand after because he said, hey, let me help you up. Wow. And then he went and presented her. And I thought this was so neat because some people are saying, well, why did why did Peter send him out of the room? Was it because he just needed extra like healing power or resurrection power focus? Or was it so he didn't look like a fool if nothing happened? I don't think that was it. I think he was saying, I'm going to model this after Jesus. And I'm going to do exactly what Jesus did and gave me that example of. And that's what happened. You know, as you were just talking about all that, something came into my mind of that morning that Jesus was at the campfire with them. Mm. And Peter, obviously, he, you know he was thinking about his sin of denying Christ three times the night before. Yeah. And Jesus looks at him and he says, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Yeah. And I, I thought about that. That probably stuck in Peter's mind. He's just modeling his Savior. Well, that's what they were talking about is that all throughout the Gospels, Peter's trying to lead Jesus. Yeah. And he's like, no, it has to be this way. And Jesus is like, I'm going to wash your feet. And Peter's like, wash my body. Yeah. <laughs> you know. And, and every time he's trying to lead Jesus. And now as he's um, had this change, he's more humbled. And now he's just following Jesus' example. Yeah. And I can't even help but think that possibly Jesus knew what was coming for Peter on this day here in Joppa. And he gave him the resurrection of Jairus's daughter as a preview by having he and James and John in the room with him when he said, you know, arise. Yeah. yeah those little, little moments of examples that he passed on and yeah. Peter was just cherishing them and using them as he went on exactly. in his ministry. Yeah. He just followed. Very cool. Okay. So let's jump into verse 42. It says, it became known all over Joppa and many believed in the Lord. And that's speaking of, it's been a minute since we read the last part, <laughs> yeah. the, the miracle. <laughs> <laughs> what, what part were you referring to? <laughs> yeah, as a recap. What, what became made known throughout all Joppa? <laughs> it's the healing. Yeah. yeah she, it, she got raised from the dead and it became known all over Joppa. And I can't, um, I can't help but think of two things when I read this verse 42 here. Number one is the most obvious would be that through this miracle, many came to belief. Mm -hmm. um, we see the same situation when Jesus healed Lazarus. Many came to believe because of the miracle. And um, so that'd be one reason for sure. But I think number two um, is perhaps it was the faith that saturated that place. Um, this is one thing I started thinking about, a place where people were so moved by the Holy Spirit that those type of miracles were happening. Mm -hmm. That could be a possibility in my mind because... We obviously see that Peter was the avenue God used, but I think about the same situation with Jesus in Mark 6, 5, where because of the lack of the faith in that place, Jesus could do no great works except mm. for heal a few sick. And so we know that faith plays a role in the extent of the miraculous, but not to say that we can always get what we want if we have enough faith, because yeah. that's an avenue that some people take. <laughs> yeah. you we, you got to be careful. But um, if it's in God's will and we meet Him with un, an undoubting heart of faith, then we do not have a form of godliness yet doubt the power of Him. Mm. Um, we can experience God's miraculous power. And, you know, the... the environment that Dorcas left behind there and the people there. It was obviously a great, a great place of faith. Yeah. And I feel like that there's a possibility that a lot of people in that town knew that she died because of the impact that she had on people. Yeah. And so when they're like, she's gone and all of a sudden she back. Yeah. You know, true. <laughs> all of a sudden well, the, like, the mere fact that they reached out for this to happen. Mm-hmm. I mean, they had to know there was something there. Yeah. And, and that's part of the whole thing about uh, God using a miracle is a lot of times the miracle may not necessarily even be for the person that it happened to. Exactly. It might be a, like Lazarus. more often than not. It's for the community that witnesses it. Yeah. It's for true. his purpose to further the gospel. Very true. So that 
That's verse 42. That's the last verse that talks about her, isn't it, Josh? Yeah, and I I, I had verse 43. Oh, <laughs> well, is it on this one? <laughs> no, it's the end of the chapter. Oh, okay. <laughs> I stopped right where she got stopped yeah, getting mentioned. <laughs> it's, it is the last one she's mentioned it. I just said, and uh, so it was that he stayed many days in Joppa with Simon a Tanner, which is, I thought, really neat because this is exactly where Peter needs to be for his next great assignment which is the gospel of the Gentiles, which we will talk about eventually when we start profiling Peter. Yeah. But I thought it's just neat how God's chessboard works. That's true. And while he might've been on a road trip to Joppa, God got him there quicker and uh, got him in place for the next thing that he was supposed to do. And all the while, I still think he's working on this whole, um, I'm a Jew, so I have to be consecrated. I have to be clean because he's staying at a Tanner's house, and we, he struggled with that. Yeah, we could we could talk about all of that. So, well, no, that's good you mentioned. I mean, we set the scene. We might as well show why you know the Holy Spirit led him there. Yeah. This happened, and then yeah. he's set up for the next uh, mile in the well, stretch. Bam! It's yeah. it's awesome. Yeah, which we will do a profile of Peter at some point. It's just gonna it's gonna be a long one because he has a uh, yeah. extensive history in the Bible. He does. That will be a long one. Yeah. So, well, I know that we've got some takeaway points, Josh. We really do. Do you want to kick us off? I can. I can. Um, So, I did the pastoral thing where I uh, I did a three point uh, presentation. Very nice. (laughs) So this might take a little bit, but I wanted to talk about how Dorcas was defined by her deeds, and this is a woman who lived a life on mission. She was a disciple. We, we find that out first thing. And she's one that had embraced the faith of Christ and was baptized. And not only that, but she was known for her works and her charity. She demonstrated her faith by her works and she abounded in them. Many pastors and commentators point out that not only did she constantly do and think these good works and giving to people. She also did them. I said that, which she did. She was full of good works. And really to me, she is a Proverbs 31 woman. We don't know what her marital status was, but I almost appreciate that more in the context of this story, that she's not defined only by a relationship, that she's Dorcas, wife of blah, blah, blah. Don't get me wrong. There are examples of dynamic and powerful married couples in the Bible. It's just really neat to see this outstanding follower of God on fire, and she's fulfilling the call of pure and undefiled religion by caring for the widows of the church there in Joppa. And I just mentioned that she's a Proverbs 31 woman, I wanted to reference some of the verses that I would connect with her. Uh, Verse 17 of Proverbs 31, she is energetic and strong, a hard worker. 19 and 20, her hands are always busy spinning thread, her fingers twisting fiber. She extends a helping hand to the poor and opens her arms to the needy. 25 and 26, she is clothed with strength and dignity, and she laughs without fear of the future. When she speaks, her words are wise, and she gives instructions with kindness. And so not only is she defined by her deeds, she's also defined by her friends and fellow believers because while Dorcas is our profilee and the main character of this tiny vignette story here in the book of Acts, the miracle that takes place in this story doesn't depend on her at all. It depends on the friendship and faith of the disciples around her. They are the ones who reach out to Peter and by faith walk three and a half hours to ask him to come. Again, resurrections were not something that anyone but Jesus had done before. And I can't help but think of the parallel of this story and the paralyzed man from Mark chapter two. Most of us know that story. Let me kind of give you the the details of it. Jesus is teaching in a crowded house and these four guys bring their paralyzed friend to Jesus, believing that he'll heal him. And they can't get in. So instead of giving up, they go up on the roof, that is, and they just start giving the house a remodel, a skylight, if you will. (laughs) And uh, they lower him down and there's this really cool interaction. And it was the faith of his friends who did something pretty bold and outrageous that ended up resulting in his receiving forgiveness for his sins and healing to rise up and carry his bed and walk. And application wise, it reminded me that as a believer, am I walking in faith for change? and salvation and healing uh, for friends and people that God loves. Not necessarily for the resurrection from the dead physically, because that doesn't happen very often. It's pretty rare. But perhaps the resurrection into new life spiritually. 
uh, for healing and deliverance from bondage of sin and, and for deliverance from difficulties of this life? Am I carrying my corner of the mat by faith, believing God can do what I can? And, and that was, um, her being defined by her friends. And the last thing I'll say was she was defined by her faith. After everything, Dorcas still died and went to heaven. That's the crazy thing about anybody that was resurrected. Lazarus still died. Eutychus, even though he got bored during a Bible study and fell out a window, later on when he was an older man, he still died. But the result of Dorcas's life after she she did pass that second time and went to heaven, the result was the salvation of many. What a testimony that God could and would use our lives, live by faith to show his power and draw lost people to himself. And the last reference I'll give, or one of the last references, is a guy named Mordecai Ham, because I don't know if you've heard of him. He was not the most effective preachers of his day, but a young man named William heard his message, responded, and got saved. And that made his entire ministry valid because this guy named William Franklin Graham, better known as Billy, would in turn reach millions. Yeah. What a turn of events there. Right? Yeah. That's pretty awesome. And so I have one or two more things to say, but I just spoke forever, so you go. (laughs) Okay. Um, well, no, those were good. Those are great, good insights. Um, one that I saw was to continue in good works. Uh, in verse 36, we saw that uh, the works Dorcas did were continual. Uh, what she did, she did persistently. Mm-hmm. And we read in Galatians 6, 9, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. And I really think that's a that's such a pivotal verse um, for Christians because Let's face it, when things get hard, we want to give up. Mm. Uh, When obstacles come, it's easier to say, you know what, this isn't what I signed up for. Uh, Why would I keep doing this when perhaps you have very little joy, zeal? Maybe you don't see any light at the end of the tunnel or the situation doesn't seem to be going anywhere. Galatians 6, 9 tells us that we see benefits with um, w- when we stick with it if we don't give up. Mm. And so that's one thing she did. Dorcas did that well. Uh, persistently, she lived for God day after day, and it led to a legacy that landed in Scripture, a uh, strong and loyal family in Christ and her miraculous rise from death. So that'd be a major takeaway point that I saw is continue, persevere, mm. pers- yeah. uh, persistence. Yes, yeah. And I just want to say this. Be a Dorcas. (laughs) Don't let, you know, don't let that word uh, discourage you from following after her footsteps because she's awesome. Yeah. And then one more takeaway that I saw was um, to get plugged into a group of believers. Although we see flashes of, of the story of Dorcas, we definitely see that she was very active with the believers in Joppa. She cared and provided for her brothers and sisters, and they did the same for her. And this type of thing only happens when you're plugged into a closer circle of believers. Uh, John thirteen thirty five says, By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And this scripture is speaking of the love between believers, and that's what we see in the story of Dorcas. Uh, You pointed some of this out already, Josh, but that's the overflow of God's love in her and in the local church that led to her being raised from the dead. And many did, in fact, believe because of it. So um, as iron sharpens iron, getting into a group of believers that um, interacts more than just a Sunday morning a week, Mm -hmm. that's going to help God grow you more, and it it makes a major difference in a Christian's life. That's right, yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, one of the last things that I found, and I thought this was interesting, is sometimes when our name means something, or sometimes when um, our name is, is even in the Bible, like a namesake, like Stephen is in the Bible or Joshua is, uh, we'll go looking for some of those verses. For me, Joshua 1, nine is, Be strong and courageous in the Lord and the power of His might. So I thought about gazelle verses. <laughs> if I, and this might be a stretch, but I thought maybe she, even just for her namesake, could lean back on. And a couple of them are Psalm 18, 31 through 36. It says, For who is God except the Lord? Who but our God is a solid rock? God arms me with strength, and He makes my way perfect. He makes me as sure-footed as a deer or a gazelle, enabling me to stand on mountain heights. He trains my hands for battle. He strengthens my arm to draw a bronze bow. You have given me your shield of victory. Your right hand supports me. Your help has made me great. You have made a wide path for my feet to keep them from slipping. 
And then Habakkuk 3, 17 through 19, which I think applies a lot right now to the way people feel with COVID. It says, even though the fig trees have no blossoms and there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and when the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me as sure-footed as a gazelle, able to tread upon the heights. And I think... That's probably something that Dorcas could have looked back on, you yeah. know, as her daily verses, like God is with me yeah, and that's why I persevere. That's why I constantly serve him. That's cool. So yeah, I, I just want to say if you need encouragement today, be a Dorcas, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> well, it was great to be with you guys on this, this awesome profile. We hope that it gave you something to chew on throughout this week. Uh, and if this episode did, in fact, mean something to you, then share it with someone. We don't care how you share it. Maybe just bring it up in um, a conversation with somebody yeah. that you run into this week. And maybe you're thinking, man, I, I didn't walk away with anything on this episode. <laughs> <laughs> well, just hang tight for another week. Give us a chance to redeem ourselves because we're going to come up with a, a new topic next week. Yes. And if you are dropping that immaturity bomb of like, hey, you Dorcas, yeah. <laughs> then maybe explain what that means. Because I I just, again, the, the youth pastor in me jumps out of my skin just with joy at being able to talk about this Bible character because of how awesome she was and, yeah. and all that she uh, is attributed to. Maybe next time you're tempted to call someone a Dorcas, you'll think of the gazelle-like ways of the character in the Bible. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and <don't laughs> Josh just looks at me like, that was corny. <laughs> well, I was like, don't, just don't use it as a slander, you dorkus. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave it alone. <laughs> uh, yeah. And um, we would love to hear your feedback on this, uh, your comments, because, again, she's another one of the powerhouse women of the Bible, and we're going to continue to profile both men and women because God uses everything everyone and he can use anyone. And uh, there are a lot of interesting profiles coming down the pipe at some point. And uh, we ask that if you have a Bible character that you would like profiled, please send us an email at connect at snakebird.com or connect with us on Facebook through a direct message or even just a post. You can make it public and uh, you can join the discussion as uh, we'll definitely answer you and, and maybe some others will jump on as well and just have um, a really cool talk about who Dorcas is. And, and it might even draw some attention by somebody going, I don't understand why you're, you're calling each other Dorcases. <laughs> and let us know if we missed anything, if that's even possible between verses 36 and 42. Yes. But let, let us know uh, if there's some other insights that you pulled out of the story. <laughs> Next time we'll be uh, profiling Nerdus from the Bible. <laughs> okay, there is no Nerdus, so. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah. Well, snake birds, always remember, whatever you do, wherever you go, no matter what life throws at you, there's never been a better time to follow the words of Jesus. Act like a Dorcas and, and be a snake bird. bird.